We're finishing our series right now called Connected, where we're looking at some unfinished business. Unfinished business. Now, I'm a sports guy, so for me, a lot of times when I think of unfinished business, I think of a team that did really, really well during the regular season and then couldn't win the championship. Whoa! <laughs> we, we're, we're fired up over here. We're fired. All right. So, so sometimes there are teams that do extraordinarily well during the season, but they don't accomplish the main thing. So, I mean, just to jog your memories, because it just happened, the Red Sox had a historic regular season, and then they went on to win the World Series, okay? So they finished their business. But in other sports, there are certainly teams that do a lot of amazing things during the regular season, but they don't accomplish the main thing. Our guy Solomon had some unfinished business. If you're familiar with Solomon, I don't, maybe he's a, that, that's a foreign name to you. Maybe you kind of think of some things that, that come to mind when, when I say Solomon and, and wisdom, money. He was a king. He had, a lot, had some women trouble. Um, wrote Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. I mean, there were a bunch of things that Solomon did that were really, really good. He, like, had a pretty awesome regular season, if you will, but he missed the main thing. He had some serious unfinished business when it came to fulfilling the promise that his daddy had asked him to do. Hey, so if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in um, 1 Kings chapter 2 and chapter 3. And we're going to be working through um, this guy named Solomon. Now, just to kind of set the, set the stage for you, uh, we're, in the, we're in this idea of the, of the, the better story, if you will. The fact that um, the scriptures are all one story. It's, it's not like they're just segmented stories. So when, I, when we talk about David or we talk about Solomon or we talk about somebody like that, it's not like they were just kind of like one-offs that you can study and learn a couple moralistic lessons and then you move on. No, they actually all point to the good news of Jesus Christ if you have eyes to see. And so the, the reason we can say that with confidence because when you look at the scriptures, it's actually one story with four chapters. Creation, all was good. Fall is when sin entered the world and people started moving their own way outside of God and stuff broke down like crazy. Redemption is God saying, I'm not gonna leave my people like that. I'm gonna enter into their brokenness, become broken for them so that they no longer have to be defined by that. That's what Jesus is all about. And then renewal. That's the promise that Jesus is actually going to come back, that he's going to come back and renew all things. The reason we always like to start there is because we want to position you in that story. So when we read, Sol we read about Solomon, he's not in the first chapter of creation. He's more in the second chapter of the fall, but before redemption, before God broke into humanity, before Christmas, right, before what we're getting ready to celebrate. This is Solomon. He was in a time when God was taking his people and, and bringing them together. And he had used Solomon's dad, David, to start this really awesome move. Now, David was a man after God's own heart. He was not perfect. I love that about David. You know what's cool about David is you don't have to be perfect to still be a man or woman after God's own heart. He uses messy people in messy situations to win their hearts for his glory. Something happened, though just one generation down. Because Solomon was not the same type of man after God's own heart, although he had a lot of good stuff about him. We're going to pick up that story in uh, 1 Kings chapter 2. Uh, as, we, as we kind of walk our way through, you have a handout that might help you uh, as we go. We're going to walk our way through the life of Solomon, and we're going to see, hey man, there are some certain things that I think the Lord wants to maybe teach me, and then we're going to see, how does all this point to Jesus and what does this have to do with like my next week, with my marriage that isn't working, or with my child that won't return more calls, or with my addiction that keeps holding my name, or with the fact that I got a raise and my life's awesome? What does all this have to do with like my current status? We're going to take a look at, at, at what that means because we never want to walk away from scriptures and think it's a historical document that's not living and active and ready to change you. So in, uh, in 1 Kings uh, chapter 2, verse 3, we see that he has a great start. He has a great start. And here's what he's told. Here's what he's told by David. 
he's like, Here, here's the promise. Um, I've got this covenant, and I want you to uh, walk in the ways that I've taught you, and I want you to keep the statutes. Let's check out this next verse here. And keep the charge. This is David talking to his son Solomon. This is a, this is a, it's a good start now. So Solomon, he doesn't come from bad stock. He comes from a family. He comes from David who wasn't perfect, but he gave his best to him. And this is what he says. And keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in his ways and keeping his statutes, his commandments, his rules, and his testimonies. Okay, hold on, hold on. David is given clear instructions. Isn't it cool how like when we, when we fall down in life, it's usually not because we were super confused. It's because we had a divided heart. Most of the time, most of the time when you find yourself kind of caught in that place where either you, you're, it's, it's kind of broken around you or you're hurting those around you, it's not because you didn't know what to do. It's because you didn't do the right thing with what you knew to do. I mean, David, uh, Solomon starts the same way. It's really simple. Keep the charge of your Lord. Okay, so here's the deal. Why is he talking about the Lord your God? David was given a promise. Here's the promise that David got. David was like, listen, um, or God was talking to David. I'm going to let somebody from your family always be on the throne. Your family will always rule Israel as long as they walk in faithfulness, as long as they keep their eye on me. Like somebody from your family will always be king of Israel. That was an amazing, amazing promise. It would actually lead to somebody who would come in and fulfill that perfectly because what we're going to see is the first king after David messes it up. So it must not necessarily be a biological fulfillment that's going to make this thing work. But this is, the, this is, here's the charge. Keep the charge of the Lord your God, walk in his ways, and keep his statutes. So like, do what, do what you know, the, the law of God has taught you to do. His commandments, his rules, and his testimonies. Next, next slide, please. As it is written in the law of Moses that you may prosper in all you do and wherever you turn. Okay, so here, David he gets the game plan. He's like, if you just follow the Lord, if, if you follow the Lord as I do, it doesn't mean that David was perfect, but David walked in the way, he walked in the statutes. His, the cool part about David and why the scriptures can say David was a man after God's own heart was not that he was perfect, but that he was repentant. Do you know what that word means? It's kind of a churchy word. It means that, that David was willing to acknowledge and own his wrong, ask for help, and start walking a different direction. So when we talk about somebody who's repentant, that doesn't just mean they own their wrong because you can own your wrong over and over and over again and, and like live this life in the same wrong. You'd be like, oh yeah, my bad again. Oh, I did it again. Oh, sorry, I'm being super vulnerable here. I was an idiot again. But like, you never change. That's not repentance. That's just being honest about your cul-de-sac of sin. Like, I'm here again. Anybody wanna join me? And people are like, no, why are you still, what, what's happening? Why aren't, why aren't you willing to take some suggestions and walk out of that cul-de-sac? That's the cool part about David. If you read Psalm 51, it's like, man, God, I, I have messed, I have, I've crushed your, I've broken your heart. Now would you create in me a new heart? Give me a new spirit. So David had this spirit of repentance that made him a man after God's own heart. And he's inviting his son Solomon to, to follow him. Follow him in that. And if you do, you're going to prosper. You're going to prosper. Okay, so it's a great start. So um, as, you, as you continue the narrative, which I would encourage you to do to read 1 Kings chapter 2 and 3, um, as you continue the narrative, you're going to see that his kingdom was established firmly. It says that a couple verses later. Like everything was, was in proper place. He had a great start. But as you know, it's not how you start the race. It's how you I need more candy or something. Like, what was all that? You guys, it's how you finish. No, no, no. It's how you finish. You got you to understand. It's not how you say your vows when you stand before me and I say, do you take this man and do you take this woman? It's in year seven and year 12 and three kids later when you look at that person and say, there's everything in me that wants to walk away, but because I've said I do, I will say I will even today. I'm here. I love you. Let's work on this together. That, that's, that's the kind of inside perspective one needs to finish well. It's so easy to start well and 
Solomon had a great start. If you're here and you're a new believer, that's awesome. We, we love you. We actually tend to see, see people come to faith and baptize them. We get to see new believers all the time. So here's the deal with the new believer. I'm going to give an equation here in just a second that you need to pay a special attention to. Because sometimes in our new journey with Jesus, we think once we've begun, man, that, that was the first step was the hardest step. But what we're going to see is we've been called into a marathon of obedience in the same direction. And it's not just about how you begin. It's going to be how you finish. Or else we too will come to the end of our lives with unfinished business. So uh, we see as a great start. Now, now he, he goes on to um, get this cool request, a great ask. He moves on to this thing as his life kind of begins and he's about... Mm, uh, most commentator, the commentator I was reading thought he was about 20 when he took the throne. So he's a young guy, and um, he comes to the Lord, and basically he's like, Lord, um, I don't know how to go out or how to come in. I don't know how to govern people. Will you give me um, wisdom? Wisdom. So many of us think about uh, Solomon with wisdom, and that's a great thought because that's what he asked for. The Hebrew word actually means um, listening or hearing. Would you give me a hearing or a listening mind? So he didn't just want wisdom like, oh, I want to be able to know, you know, kind of know how to best handle the situation. What Solomon asked for was the ability to hear God. He wanted the ability to have a heart that listened to God in difficult situations. That's just a fantastic ask, man. It is a great, great ask. So if we go to the next verse, this comes up in 1 Kings 3. Go ahead and, and we can go to that next slide. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind. Okay, that word understanding is listening heart to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this, your great people? Here's what Solomon knew. God was doing something awesome. God was doing something awesome. And he was now like at the center of it. And what he would need would be this listening heart. So, so it's a good ask. Even we know it's a good ask because God, in his response to this ask, says, hey, thanks for asking this, or, or basically, well done. Because you asked this, I'm going to give you riches. I'm going to give you all this stuff that you didn't actually ask for because I like your motive and where you are in asking. And so we see here, man, this is, it's a really good ask in the beginning of his career. Interesting, though, one of the guys I was reading posed this question. It's a good ask, but what, was it a great ask? Is there something he could have asked for that would have been better? So the context is that God comes to Solomon in a dream, and he's like, I'll give you whatever you want. Just ask it. And this, this is what Solomon asks for. And, and the commentator's like, that's a good ask, but was it the best? Because what we see here is that even though he had a listening heart, it still was divided. His divided heart is what would eventually wipe him out and lead to a life that can be termed unfinished business. Interesting how there can be a lot of talented, gifted, passionate believers around us who don't finish well because maybe they're asking for the wrong things. Not a bad ask. Maybe it could have been better. We see here that... Um, there, there's not a great ending. If we can go to the next, uh, the next slide. A great fail. So we're in, in 1 Kings 12 now. As you can see, I'm walking you through that whole narrative. It would be a great thing for you to read this week, a couple of chapters a day. Um, and there's a, there's a rebellion. By the end of Solomon's life, when his son takes over, uh, well, let's look at the next verse. What does it say? It says, so Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. The kingdom that had come together and, and was thriving under King David, a man after God's own heart, within the lifetime of Solomon, was now divided and would forever be divided, just like its king's heart. Interesting, just kind of a, a family thought here, as you um, enter into, we have a lot of young families, things like that, it's really difficult for the leader of that family's heart not to be passed on to the family itself. It's just a really, it's a, it's, a, it's a, that's a, we call it breaking a generational curse. It can be done. But as we see here from Solomon to the nation of Israel, how his heart was becomes manifest in the people that he leads. Sometimes it's interesting when you look at the people you lead and you see things that aren't like 
uh, healthy about them, it's an awesome opportunity to take a look at your own heart and ask, Lord, is that actually a reflection of what's happening here first? So we see this epic fail, and we have to ask ourselves the question, like, how did Solomon, who was surrounded by so many awesome things, get to this point of having unfinished business? Unfinished business. How is he, like the many teams or musicians or whoever you might say, how is he, like the, like the, like the, the artists and the politicians and the athletes who do a lot of good things but don't do the main thing? How did he get to this place of unfinished business. I think we get a pretty good clue here in uh, 1 Kings 3, 3. This is what it says. So as you can tell, I've taken you through the narrative, and now we go back and we, we drill down a little bit on this particular verse. Solomon loved the Lord. We've got to stay there a second, lest you think Solomon was not somebody who had affection for God. Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David, his father. Now, you'd be careful. Be careful to think that Solomon was a cold-hearted dude. Or be careful to think that Solomon didn't do a lot of the right things. He loved God, and he walked in the statutes of David, his father. Only. If you have a Bible, and you have something to mark it with, or you can highlight something on your Bible on your phone, you need to just go crazy over this word right here. Circle it, underline it, like let it jump off the page into your heart. Only he sacrificed and made offerings at the high places. Unfinished business, man. And here's the deal um, with Solomon. Uh, first of all, high places. Uh, what, is, what is a high place? Well, a high place would be something that was set up, and it was actually literally higher than the ground, and it was set up, and there would be altars on these high places. Now, what, what, what you would need to understand to make sure that we do the, con the passage justice is before the temple was built, if you went to a high place, it would be okay as long as you were worshiping and making sacrifices to the Lord your God alone. As long as you didn't mix that with a sacrifice to this God or that God or whatever, the high places before the temple was built, they were okay to go to for God's people if they were just going to use them to make offerings and sacrifices to the Lord their God, not if they were going to mix anything within them. See, the danger, though, of high places is that they are mostly known for uh, idol worship. They are mostly known for places where people perform offerings and sacrifices to idols, so, so a couple things here. Number one, the, the context in which Solomon had regular worship seemed to be a little bit, um, seemed to be a little bit dangerous, seemed to be in places that could be known for false god worship. Number two, it doesn't automatically mean that Solomon was worshiping a false god when he was at those high places. It doesn't automatically mean that, especially in, this is chapter three, okay, so it's still early in his kingship. But what we know about his life gives us a glimpse that absolutely Solomon's heart was divided and most likely he was worshiping other gods even from the beginning. Two things. Number one, he married Pharaoh's daughter. God was really clear, do not marry with other people because what's going to happen in that context is their gods are going to win your heart, they're going to affect you, and they're going to turn your heart away from me. Number two, we see that Solomon, at the end of his life, had like um, 700 wives and a ton of concubines, none of which are God's design for marriage. When you look at Genesis, one man, one woman. None of which, when you see, when you see a person who has multiple wives in the Old Testament or concubines, it, it never like works out good. If you know those stories, it's like a tragic, I mean, God can sometimes work good out of the mess, but like, it's, it's tragic because it's always out of God's design. So when we, when we examine Solomon's life and we see that he initially marries this woman, although it was a good political move because maybe it brought a little bit of peace, it was a horrible worship move. 
By the end of his life, he has 700 wives, many of which are foreign. And the scriptures are very clear toward the end of 1 Kings that it turned Solomon's heart away from God. It turned his heart away from God. So there's unfinished business because he's got this division in his heart. And there's no way that God is going to be able to finish his business in your life as to what he's called you to accomplish if your heart is divided like Solomon's. There's this interesting um, sort of equation that, uh, that, I don't know, I just kind of was thinking through as, as I was working on the passage, and, and here's how it goes. Emotional connection, which is what Solomon had, right? He had emotional connection. It said that he, what did he, he loved the Lord. When you have an emotional connection, you love the Lord, so there's, there's emotion, there's affection, like you, you have good feelings about who God is and, and warmth, and you, there's even a love there. Emotional connection plus expected patterns. So Solomon was actually doing some of, some of the things that David told him to do. It said that he was walking in David's statutes. Plus only, only he worshipped at these other places. Only he made exception here in this area of his life. What that equals is unfinished business. What that equals is a king that divided the kingdom and had this epic, epic fail, although he had amazing resources around him. So I wonder if this is playing out in some of our lives. Some of us might have an emotional connection to Jesus. We're like, I love Jesus, I worship Jesus. Man, during that last song set, I was like hands in the air, like I just don't care. Like it was on Jesus and me, all these people I came with, it doesn't matter what they're thinking, because I love Jesus. Some of us have an emotional connect. We write our journals or we have like the wristbands or the shirt. I mean, we are emotionally connected to Jesus and we're doing some expected patterns, right? Like, like we're actually walking the walk to a degree. We're going to church, we've got maybe a Bible study. Um, you know, we read our Bible sometimes, where there's prayer. We, we're doing some expected patterns, like this is what I was told to do when I became a believer. These are things that are gonna be helpful to me. I've got an emotional connection to Jesus. I've got some expected patterns where I'm, it seems like I'm doing the right things, but I've got this only in my life. Because I, you know, I've heard people confront me on my like, sexual purity, but I just can't see how my sexual choices have anything to do with my relationship with God. Like, I should be able to sleep with my boyfriend. I should be able to sleep with my girlfriend. We should be able to live together. I mean, this is kind of like the nature of our context in this world today. Why would that have anything to do? So, so I'm going to continue to love Jesus. I'm going to continue to go to church and do these expected patterns, but I'm going to have an only. I'm going to have sort of a high place that I keep to myself. Maybe it's, maybe it's not that. Maybe it's pornography. Or it's like, you know what? I'm not really hurting anybody. This is something that, you know, I kind of can justify because things aren't good here. Or I get stressed here. And, you know, at least it's not this. And so I love Jesus and I do a lot of the things that I'm supposed to do, but I keep an only in my heart. I don't know. Maybe it's, maybe it's your, like your anger. Maybe it's like, I love Jesus. I do the right things but I make space for my anger because I, I feel like I kind of deserve it. And given my situation, I'm right to be angry. I'm right to be unforgiven, unforgiving. I'm right to be bitter. And you, you, can't, you, you, you go to your high spot and you, you, got, you, you got your Jesus on at 10 a.m. But then Tuesday, when you walk into the office and there's that person who just has been so hard and cold and bitter and hurtful to you, you go to your high place and you worship and you maintain your own bitterness. It might be gossip, might be the way you spend money. I don't, I don't know. Here's what I do know. When we maintain and only in the midst of this equation, it always ends in unfinished business. You wanna know what my only is? that the Lord's been knocking down for years. I keep waiting to feel a certain way before I'm faithful in certain situations. You might not understand this. This might not make any sense to you. But there, there, there are times in my life when I want to feel the presence of God before I'll fully give myself to you. 
and it makes me anxious that I don't feel a certain way. And so I'm there, but I'm also removed, and I'm trying to kind of generate some sort of feeling before I actually obey God and love you well. It's like, it's like, I, like I kind of have a, an only here. And call it anxiety, call it a restless heart, call it whatever you want. But I keep waiting for God to give me another sign of his goodness before I'll like actually commit at some level. And I know for a fact there are areas in my life in my family, in my relationships, where I walk in unfinished business. Now I'm here to tell you today that God has been knocking that down. And I, like David, wanna be a man of repentant heart and I keep striving toward him and asking him to interrupt that division in my heart. No more signs, your resurrection and your presence is enough. Fill me with your spirit and allow me to walk in faithfulness. So I fight against it all the time, but I know where it is. If you don't know where your only is, that's more dangerous than admitting it to a group of people who are safe and can help you get back. So what's the better battle here? Um, my 13 year old and I are, are we're excited about this movie coming out, right? It's a uh, um, called Creed 2. Anybody psyched for Creed 2 to come out? Wednesday, I think it comes out. Every time we see that preview and like that song comes on, like we stop and we'll watch the preview. I mean, we could be having some like sweet family devotion, like altar moment in the, in the home and we hear like that uh, 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 Rocky's voice talk about like, yo, your dad died in my arms right here. Like we'll, we'll be like, wait, this is important, but whoa, it's Creed 2 coming. We're going to go see that. It's going to be, I'm a sucker, man. I will be a sucker for Creed 7. And then when Creed has a baby, I'll be a sucker for little baby Creed 3 and 4. I don't know what it is. I like love the Rocky and then the Creed. And, you know, he's supposed to, I think in this one, I haven't, I haven't seen it fully. I mean, I mean obviously, because we're watching previews. But, but I, I don't have the full gist of who he's supposed to fight, but I think maybe he's supposed to fight, correct me if I'm wrong if you know, like the Russian guy who, who killed his dad's son or something like that. Some, yes, am I right? Oh man, this is so good. All right, I can't wait. So listen, here's the deal. Wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be crazy weird if Creed, Creed II comes out and you watch this movie and this dude trains, right? He's like, he goes faster than that, right? I'm just, I'm back to Rocky IV. Remember Rocky IV when he's like training, but then there's like the music and he's all sweaty and it's like, uh, okay, he's training, he's doing all this stuff. He's lifting like a big ox cart. He's doing all the things that like Rocky used to do because I'm sure Rocky's gonna be part of his, his training crew. And then he shows up to the big fight. It's like, man, here it is. It's gonna be this redemptive moment. And then he gets in there and, the, and the, the, like, the graphics are even better than Rocky IV because I'm still hooked on Rocky IV. But like it even looks like he's getting hit. He's getting torn up, but he's fine. Man, we're watching. My son and I, we're like, whoosh, snow cap, whoosh, popcorn, sweet and salty. This is awesome. So, and so we're watching this fight, man. It's going down. He's up and he's down. It's this epic battle, right? At the end, I don't know what happens. This is not a spoiler alert. I'm making this up. At the end, he kind of like, if I go to Rocky II, he kind of just gets up before the, 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 the poor Russian guy that's all like, he's been beaten down. And it's like, man, Creed, because he had this great heart. Man, he's able to win at the end. Everybody's like, ah. He's like, yeah, my daddy's gone, but Rocky comes out. And it's like, man, full redemption. And at, and at the end of the movie, you see this other scene, right? And in this other scene, there's this guy, and he's decked out in his Russian apparel, and he looks a lot like Drago. And um, he's like waiting for Creed little guy to show up. He's waiting for Creed two to show up. And, and you, you see in the credits that unfortunately, because of a miscommunication, Creed actually went to the wrong bout. He went to the wrong place and he fought the wrong battle. He won and it was pretty cool. He did some really good things with what he had. And it was a pretty epic battle for him to win, but he actually never got the redemption he wanted because he fought the wrong battle. And the Russian guy's like, <laughs> they're thinking, man, I win. TKO because the guy never showed up. 
I think a lot of us live our whole Christian lives fighting the wrong battle. I think a lot of us train and we do some of the right things, but then we show up to the wrong bout over and over and over again. We show up to the big arena with the words, better behavior underneath it. And we're like, we're going to win it this time. I'm going to get a hold on my anger. I'm not going to look at porn again. I'm not going back to my addiction. Whatever it takes. We just like white knuckle it and we fight and man, it's like, ugh. And sometimes we win, and sometimes we lose. We actually feel kind of good about it because our mouth's bleeding and we're, like, and we're like, man, we did something. Well, all the while, the enemy's like, wrong bout, sucker. Keep fighting that. Keep giving the best of who you are over there. Keep trying to win the battle of behavior when it seems clear according to the gospel message that the battle is not one of behavior, but one of belief. We're fighting the wrong battle. Solomon, in his battle, fought the wrong battle. It's not so much about how you behave as it is about what you believe, because what you believe will always drive how you behave, not the other way around. Well, what, is, what does that look like to fight the battle of belief? What does it look like to, because here, here's the deal, in Solomon's case, you know, let me just turn this around for you guys. In Solomon's case, it seemed very clear that, that this was a guy who was looking for his good outside of God. He had gotten a lot of good things from God, but it was like, man, he decided that God wasn't enough, that somehow God was holding out on him, that the wisdom God had given him and the money God had given him and the power and the kingdom that God had given him, man, he wanted more of it because the person of God wasn't enough. It was like he was way attracted to the prizes of God and not the person of God. And so for Solomon, here is a guy who was looking for his good outside of God, and he went elsewhere to find it. When you do that, it will always result in unfinished business. Here's our four Gs. If you've been here a while, man, I can't teach this enough. These are things that God has put on my heart. They're from a book called You Can Change by Tim Chester. And this is what he says. There's four truths about God because of Jesus Christ that are always true. God is great, therefore I don't need to be in control. God is good, therefore I don't need to look elsewhere. God is glorious, therefore I don't need to fear others. And God is gracious, therefore I don't need to prove myself. Anytime you find yourself in unfinished business, it's not because your behavior is horrendous, although it might be. It's not because you need to try harder and white knuckle it, although there's effort involved in change. It's because you have a belief issue, not at the root a behavior issue. God is so great, therefore you don't need to be in control, therefore you don't need to be captured by your anger, by your words, by your bitterness. God is so good, therefore you don't need to look elsewhere sexually, whether it's with substances. God is so glorious, therefore you don't need to fear others and the approval that you get sometimes but never seems to last, and God is so gracious, therefore you don't need to prove yourself. Solomon, look, Solomon chose over and over and over again. He actually, if you read Ecclesiastes, it's like he went on tour trying to find his good. And he looked elsewhere over and over and over again. Now at the end of Ecclesiastes, he makes some comments that seem to like, be like, man, it's just in God. But it seems like the, the trajectory of his life unfortunately looked outside of his, his God and found himself elsewhere. I encourage you to fight the better battle. If you have an only in your life, don't go to the high place by yourself thinking you're gonna outbehavior this thing. Ask God to show you and others around you, what is it that I'm believing about God that makes me go to this high place? 
and then fight the battle of saying, what does the scripture say about how great God is so that I don't need to be a control freak, so that I don't need to be like raptured up in my anxiety, so that I don't need to like crush my kids every time they get out of my control. What is it that I need to believe more and more? Where are the scriptures? What can I, Holy Spirit help me to believe that God is so good so that I don't need to keep going to my porn, so that I can actually have some healthy boundaries in my relationships, so that I don't have to work 70 hours a week. God, like here's the battle I need to fight. I gotta keep my eyes on you somehow, some way. I gotta text somebody. My eyes are wandering. My heart is prone to wander because I'm forgetting how glorious you are and I'm starting to fear this person and I'm starting to fear that person. God, help me to believe better. Help me to keep my eyes on you. God, I keep trying to prove myself over and over and over again. Man, I want people to think this. God, I don't know if your graciousness is enough, and I think that I've got to keep behaving a certain way for you to keep me. I know I've given my life to Christ. I know I've accepted him as my Savior. But God, I know there's probably something i got to do to prove that I deserve that. You need to fight this battle right here and get people around you to say that you are a son, you are a daughter, period. The finished work of Christ says it all. You don't need to keep looking outside of yourself. These are the battles that will either lead us to a life where we finish the business that God had for us or we become a little Solomon. As we get ready to close, I wanted to connect this to Jesus. We're doing these um, lessons and, and messages with our children at AC Kids, and um, there's always a Christ connect for them, always, that points the passage that they're into to Jesus. And so the question that I want to leave us today with is, is how does this point us to Jesus? There's certainly a ton of ways um, where it might point us to Jesus, and, and I, I feel like the Lord was pretty clear about the one way that it points us to Jesus very clearly. Jesus is the better finisher. He's the better finisher. Solomon could not finish the business God had set before him to do because he had a divided heart. But Jesus, because his heart was not divided, because he had an emotional connection to his father, because he walked in expected patterns, and because he had no only was able to go to a cross and take your sin and mine. And because the Father is holy and just, he chose to pour out his wrath. It's gotta go somewhere. Rather than on you and on me, he chose to pour it out on Jesus, his son. And when the wrath of God when the wrath of God the Father had been fully poured out, like, like when God was emptying himself of all of his just wrath for you and for me because of our sinful nature, when he had come to that place where he was like, man, it was, it was being dumped out and poured out on Jesus, Jesus was able to say with authority and confidence, it is finished. It is finished. And he died the death you and I were supposed to die, man. He stuck in our place. And on the third day, he overcame our sin and he overcame our death, proving that what he said on Friday would have implications for your life every day. It's easy for me to say it is finished and then go about my life and not be able to have the authority to back that up. Jesus says the one thing that separated you, your sin and your suffering and your shame and your guilt, the one thing that separated you from the Father, I've taken and given you away to now be reunited with God. If you will repent like David, give up on yourself and trust me. If you'll follow me and hold on to me and quit waiting for signs, if you will leave your only and let me be your only, then it is finished applies to you. And the greatest thing about that today means that you're now free to believe. It is finished. Therefore, now you're free to believe. You know, at, at Christmas time, there's like this thing, right? And it's all about kind of, um, especially as you think about kids, uh, the magic is in the belief, right? I'll just leave it at that. I don't know where you go with that. But you know, this is a season where it's like, oh man, you just gotta believe, fill in the blank. Because it is finished, we get to make it about Jesus. We get to make Solomon about Jesus. We get to make our only place about Jesus. And we actually get to believe these things. We get to believe. 
there are some of you here today and man, you're just like, you're thinking about Christmas coming up and you're restless. That bag of candy and the way we started is, is like, that's not cool. Like, you're like, you don't know what Christmas is for me. It reminds me of the fact that A, I'm still single or B, I don't have kids or, or D, you know, whatever, I'm in a marriage I don't want to be in or my dad's not going to be there again and, or, or this, is, this is usually when I relapse or fill in the blank, man. The holiday season is not always a great season for everyone, me included. It's like everyone's having a good time. Why do I feel like there's a storm that won't go away inside of me? Yeah, so I'm with you. And um, because it's finished, yeah, because it's finished, I'm free to believe that God is so great that I don't need to be in control anymore. Because it's finished, I'm free to let go of some of these things that I'm saying I'll be happy when and believe that God is my good through Jesus Christ and I can quit looking elsewhere this Advent season. Because it's finished, man, I'm free to believe that God is so glorious, I don't have to be consumed with what this person thinks of me. And this last one's really special to me because it's one my little caveman's learning. I don't know if you've met my caveman or not. Uh, his name, he goes by Cade. And I'm saying that clinically because we've had, uh, been talking through some different things and we had outside observation. And one of the, thing, the things about Cade as, as people have like helped us, what about this, what about that? They reminded us, he's three years old, man. He's just like a caveman. So just like relax, you know? He's a little three-year-old boy. And if you haven't been around three-year-old boys before or in a while, they're cavemen. If they don't get what they want, it's a big deal. When they do get what they want, it only lasts forever. I mean, it only lasts temporary. They grunt, they yell, they scream, they bite. The one thing about my, my son is he throws things. It's so awesome. It's so awesome because two things are happening. Number one is he's getting this amazing arm. I mean, I'm looking, I'm for some, like I know for sure college baseball, maybe MLB. Just the way he winds up, quick release, awesome. So he gets a lot of reps every day. We gotta ice him down at night sometimes. And number two is we, we get really quick. We're getting old, my wife and I, we're, well, I'm in my mid 40s. I don't know where she is. I'm in my mid 40s. And here's what happens in the midst of this. We duck, it's like, don't, and then we're like, oh man. So here's what Cade is free to believe because it's finished. And we remind him of this all the time. He said something like this to me the other day, which is a somewhat normal conversation in our home. So daddy, you love me even when I throw chairs? Daddy, you still love me even when I throw cars? Daddy, you still love me even when I fill in the blank and I get to say yes, 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 yes. And then he asked me why. And you know, I get to come down right to his level and I get to tell him because you're my son, because you're mine. I get to express the theme of the gospel that outside of your performance, because you belong to me, my steadfast love will remain and will actually be the thing that will bring about the change you need. You know, the person who has kind of like given us some outside observation about Cade said, you know what the candy for that kid is? Your relationship. He can never afford to lose your relationship. You know what the candy for leaving your only place is? The fact that the Father in Christ has said, it is finished, now you come with me. You leave that place because I have so much better for you. Father, we ask that you would that you would fill us with your spirit. God, we've got a lot of, we got a lot of Cade running around in our hearts.
Father, I pray that through the teaching and the, and the presence of your scripture that people, people don't go away thinking, oh, well, I get to keep my only because the Father loves me. No. Father, burn in their hearts that they get to leave their only because you love them, because you're better, because they don't have to look elsewhere. They get to quit on their unfinished business and come and find you, God, what their heart actually longs for. Help us in this, Father. We want to be a people that finish our business. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Now, if you'll stand, I'm going to give the benediction. And as we always do, we have some prayer partners that are down front here. I'd like to invite those prayer partners to come up. Um, we're going to play a little bit behind you as we close. We'll be officially dismissed here, but this is always an opportunity to invite you guys to come on down and receive prayer over maybe something you're struggling to believe about God. Man, just share it. This is a safe place. Let us pray into that and ask God's spirit to increase your faith on some of the character of God. This is how we receive a benediction here if you're part of God's people. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his great and good and glorious and gracious nature shine upon you, both now and forevermore. Amen. Love you guys. See you next week.